I wanted to talk about skeptics that are sort of hidden in popular culture. Now, not just skeptics that are sort of hidden, but skeptics that don't necessarily identify themselves as skeptics. There are plenty of popular characters that are scientists, that are skeptics, that, that are label themselves as critical thinkers. I'm not so interested in those. I'm more interested in the ones that are sort of secret, the ones that are hidden, the ones that might not even themselves realize that they are indeed critical thinkers, but who have influenced generations of people. Now, when I was growing up, when I was very young, there was a particular TV show that had a scientist on it, and he would do the most fascinating experiments. He would do unbelievable experiments that would sort of change the, the, the life of the people that were around him, and it impressed me to no end that this, that this particular scientist uh, could, do, could do these unbelievable experiments. And then, of course, is the professor on Gilligan's Island. Now, now in my prepubescent discussions at school, the, the topic was always, you know, Marianne or Ginger. <laughs> <laughs> the professor is the correct answer. <laughs> so is Marianne, but that's, that's a different point, that's a different point. Um, no, because here was a guy who could make, you know, he could make a hang glider out of coconuts. I mean, this is the guy you want on the island with you when you're stuck. Yeah, Marianne and Ginger are both wonderful human beings, but the professor fixes stuff, and he fixes stuff continually, and he's the one who tells Gilligan it's not a spirit in the cave. It's just some weird bat or whatever it is. This was the guy that first in popular culture opened me up to this idea of a critically thinking scientist. Anybody know his real name or the character's name on the show? Very good, Roy Hinckley, Roy Hinckley, yes, very good. Um, Roy Hinckley, deeply, deeply influential. So um, there is this lovely history of, of critical thinkers in popular culture, starting all the way back with the Apostle Thomas, Doubting Thomas, right? Doubting Thomas is this idea, which is kind of an insult. Oh, you're a Doubting Thomas. But Thomas was the one apostle, when he heard that Jesus had been brought back from the dead, said, what? And what did he say? He said, he said, uh, except I shall see, uh, in John 20, he says, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's exactly. So there he is, of course. I love that painting. Oh, it's so, so cool. So now I think, you know, we talked about having our, our, our skeptical uh, sort of patron saint. I think Thomas should be our, our patron saint of skepticism, doubting Thomas. Because even, even he himself, alive at the time, supposedly, I know this is all story, but whatever. Um, even he at the time was able to sort of say, like, no, I want Jesus in front of me. And once Jesus was in front of him and he stuck his finger into his chest vag, then he finally said, okay, you've come back from the dead. I accept the proof. I think that's the technical term. I'll, I'll check with Steve. So now we go back in history. There was this thing uh, in the 16th century in Italy called Commedia dell'arte. Commedia dell'arte, which is an Italian street theater, which sort of introduces all of the ideas of popular tropes of drama and comedy. These characters that we still have today. There's a direct line from the Commedia dell'arte archetypes. These sort of characters: the romantic, the boss, the buffoon, the uh, the, the the lovers. Um, the, the inventor who's doing all kinds of schemes. And there's one particular character, uh, Harlequino, Harlequin, who became a Harlequin. Harlequino is like the clown, sort of. He turns into Scapino also. Scapino is, becomes this, this proto Bugs Bunny character. And he is the one that doubts a lot of things. He's the one that pulls sort of the, the pomposity out of situations. There's this direct uh, correlation, there's a direct line from Scapino to Groucho Marx to Bugs Bunny to Hawkeye to Black Adder. It's the same character. And this is, this is centuries old, this character, who's one of my favorite sort of skeptical, critical thinkers going, wait, why do, why do we do it that way? Or why do you think that's going to work? And this has, been, this has been in culture for a very, very long time. So along the same time in the 16th century, uh, we have this gentleman you might have heard of before, Billy Shakes, there he is. 
And he has some lovely, lovely skeptical, critical thinking things. In Henry the Fourth, Part One, there's two two characters are having a conversation, and one says, "I can call spirits from the vasty deep," and the other character says, "Why, so can I, or so can any man, but will they come when you call them?" <laughs> Michael Shermer totally stole that. You know, anyone can talk to the dead. It's when they talk back that's when you have to worry. You know, so that's that's Shakespeare, and that's uh, a couple hundred years ago in Julius Caesar. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. I mean, again, talk about a scientific skeptical mantra. There's this wonderful thing. A character in King Lear, Edmund, has this. I just love this expression. Uh, this is the excellent foppery of the world that when we are sick in fortune, often the surfeits of our own behavior, we make guilty of our disasters the sun, the moon, and the stars. This idea is that, yeah, when, when bad luck or I'm making bad decisions, I'm going to blame the stars. I'm going to blame astronomy or astrology or blame whatever. And Shakespeare is saying, mm, not so much, especially this character, Edmund. Now, he's the antagonist of King Lear, but still, there's sort of an interesting thing there. So, we're talking hundreds of years this character has sort of been around and has been popularized. And in no way would Edmund, I think, label himself as a skeptic or as a critical thinker, but he totally is. We move on to literature. And I'm going to sort of be mixing a lot of sort of characters, characters in movies, characters in books. There's a lot of, a lot of sort of cross-pollinization, so uh, I apologize if some things get repeated. But this is the sort of idea that within literature, there are a number, I mean, there's a countless number, and I'm going to forget people, and I, I'm aware that I'm leaving people out, so please tweet and email me right now. <laughs> I'm aware I'm leaving people out, so yeah. Um, first and foremost, the person that when you think of in literature that wouldn't necessarily self-identify as a skeptic, but who totally is, is Sherlock Holmes. Arthur Conan Doyle basically devised this idea of sort of thinking through a problem critically, looking at the evidence. Evidence-based thinking starts with Sherlock Holmes. And the thing that I love about Sherlock Holmes and his creator, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, is that Arthur Conan Doyle believed in fairies. The Cottingdale fairies, you've heard this story where these girls are in their backyard and they just made p paper cutouts and they took pictures of them and of course all of England believed that these were actual fairies. And uh, Conan Doyle would have arguments with Houdini. Houdini would just sit there and face palm, just think, how can you believe this is real? You made Sherlock Holmes and you think that these are real things. His uh, uh, Conan Doyle's wife was a spirit writer, so she would just sit with, an ink, with a pad and a pen and she would do these circles and she would be overcome by the spirit. And, you know, absolute nonsense. But he was the guy that created Sherlock Holmes, kind of the first sort of really, really evidence-based character. There's a wonderful character named Jeeves. There's the Jeeves and Worcester series by P.G. Wodehouse. Uh, this is like between 1917 and 1974. Uh, uh, this was, these books are written. He's a fictional character. It's a series of shorts. Jeeves sort of is the quintessential butler, so much so that like Kleenex, meaning tissue, Jeeves becomes to mean butler. And he's always helping Worcester, because Worcester, the man that he works for, gets into horrible predicaments, weird situations, and Jeeves very calmly very, very sort of dispassionately solves the problems by using critical thinking, by using evidence, by doing, by thinking in a way that's sort of clear. In the Scarlet Letter, Hester Prynne. So John Updike said this about, about Hester Prynne. She's an arresting and slightly ambiguous figure. She's a funny mix of truly liberated, defiantly sexual woman, but in the end, a woman who accepts the penance that society imposed on her. And I don't know, I suppose she's an epitome of female predicaments. She's a mythic version of every woman's attempt to ingratiate her sexuality, sorry, to integrate her sexuality with societal demands. Again, she wouldn't necessarily self-identify as a skeptic, and there's religious aspects to this story as well, but this is a fierce, independent woman who's trying to do the best she possibly can. There's more examples that are similar to that. Uh, Lizzie Bennet from Pride and Prejudice, similar thing. She's, she's just full of energy. She's got this spirit and resilience. She's this real, complex, many-sided character that's almost like a human being. It's really fantastic. Um, and again, a very early sort of example of a non-self-identifying, but definitely critically thinking, critically minded person. Uh, Joe March from Little Women. Same thing, you know, she's, she has a job, 
Like, what? Women work? What? Uh, she's a free spirit. She's a writer. She wants to fight in the Civil War. She wants to fight in the Civil War. And they're saying, no, you can't fight in the Civil War because you're a woman. And she questions everything all the time. She's constantly questioning. Uh, another example, uh, Jane Eyre. You know, it's, it's, there's a lot of religion that's steeped in there because of the sort of, sort of dogmatic Victorian sensibility that's associated with the book. But she's surprisingly progressive. She's surprisingly progressive. And, and she finds this kind of balance between conscience and passion. Uh, again, by sort of looking at the evidence, looking at what's in front of her, and trying to make the best decisions she possibly can. Um, and it's very culturally influential. Uh, we get a little bit more modern. Uh, George Orwell has two characters in particular, uh, Winston from 1984, who again, he's, he's, the, he's the hero of the story, but it's a tragedy because poor Winston, of course, by the end of the, of the book has been brainwashed completely. But throughout, he is questioning, he is questioning, is this, is this the way we need to live? Is this how we need to live? His, his spirit gets crushed, obviously, by the end of the thing, which is its own sort of story. Um, and did you, uh, uh, I never realized that um, uh, uh, Winston Churchill, the, the name Winston wasn't a very common name, apparently. So this obviously was a, an homage to Winston Churchill, which uh, uh, Orwell knew his, his readers would identify that with Winston Churchill. He was a big fan, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, Benjamin from Animal Farm. Uh, as a child, one of the most heartbreaking sort of sequences of any book I ever read is when poor Benjamin is... Uh, trying to warn a uh, boxer that he's in, not in a hospital truck, but he's in a glue truck. If you're not familiar with Animal Farm, it's obviously an allegory for, for communism and things like that. And Benjamin is kind of, it's kind of a, 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 he's seen everything, he's done everything. He realizes that it's all, it's all BS. All, all that stuff is just nonsense and that it's just, it's all a show. So he's a cynic, but there is a certain amount of skepticism and critical thinking there. And when he desperately is trying to yell at Boxer who's been put into the glue Oh my God, it just still, it just kills me. It just absolutely kills me. Because finally, he's acting out because his friend is being taken to the glue factory. Um, we get into some modern examples. Uh, uh, and again, there's so many more. But Elizabeth Salander from, from the uh, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. I mean, obviously, a little bit more self-identifying maybe as a skeptic or as a critical thinker. But just an incredibly strong, independent, uh, solves problems, solves problems incredibly efficiently so that magically, you know, millions of dollars end up in her bank account. That's the kind of problems that she's solving. There's also, this one was pointed out to me by a, by a friend, uh, Alphaba Throp, which is the Wicked Witch of the West in the Wicked uh, book, as well as the Wicked show. Uh, she's, she's surprisingly sort of critically minded. She's, uh, she's a supporter of animal rights. She protects a lion club in a life sciences class. She refuses to eat meat. Um, she questions everything and tries to rationalize her choices and motivations. Her goals, her sort of revolutionary goals, fade uh, when there's, a, I guess, an assassination attempt that happens and it's sort of, she ends up being kind of the mean witch that she is. But there is a reason that she sort of, sort of gets nasty, which is sort of lovely. Uh, moving on, we go to works for children. And this really surprised me. We just had this panel about this as well as Jay's talk. And there's, there's, a, there's a huge amount of works that have this lovely genesis point of skeptical, critically minded characters. So we start with, like I said, Bugs Bunny. The Scapino character, the Hadalequino character, the, the inheritor of Groucho Marx, or they're about the same time, Groucho and Bugs. And, you know, just questioning everything, just, just not, not letting fools be fools. Very influential to me personally, just, you know, there he is. Does anyone know who he's imitating right here? No, it's Leopold, 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 Leopold. Leopold's the guy that conducts in Fantasia. And he always conducts in this great way. So that's, there's totally making fun of Fantasia there, which is really great. Um, Bugs Bunny, huge influence on me. We go to kind of a, not so much an American influence, but a European influence, Tintin. Uh, Belgian uh, cartoonist, Georges Rémy. He wrote under the name Hergé. So Tintin's like 14 to 19 years old, somewhere around there. He sort of threw out, he, he grew a couple of, a couple of years. Um, but I love this. He's adept at driving or fixing any mechanical vehicle or device that he comes across. He's a skilled radio operator. He knows Morse code. He demonstrates impressive swimming skills. He's a crack shot. He proves himself a capable engineer and a scientist during his adventures to the moon. 
Ah, more than anything else, Tintin is a quick thinker and an effective diplomat. Imagine that, a quick thinker and an effective diplomat. What that must be like, we'll probably never know. Uh, he's very, like I said, very influential in Europe. Not so much in the US for whatever reason. Um, sort of moving through Wendy from the Peter Pan sort of series, more so uh, from the, the, the books on the movie. I have Walt Disney there. I know he didn't create the character, but sort of the presentation of her, she, she can be seen as being this kind of downer. Like, this isn't going to work. Like, when you can't fly, what are you talking about? But that's a great critically minded character who then once is shown the evidence says, hey, I can fly, I can fly, I can fly. But it's nice, but the initial thing isn't much like her younger, her younger siblings are just like, they're in it, they're, they're, they're ready to go. She's a little bit more hesitant and skeptical, which I, I always appreciated as a kid. Um, the, the super influential, and again, very straightforward, but Scooby-Doo, right? Now, I, I enjoyed Scooby-Doo for a certain amount of time, and then I couldn't enjoy Scooby-Doo because the motivation of Shaggy and Scooby, I thought, was ridiculous because it's always a guy in a mask! It's always a guy in a mask. Like, why are you scared? Why, this like seven seasons in, why are you scared? You should just walk up to the guy and just go, okay, we're done, that's fine. <laughs> so I was waiting for that. But again, they're, they're, it's always, now I know the movies and the modern cartoons change a little bit, they get a little bit more paranormal. But if we talk about classic Scooby-Doo, it's always a dude in a mask. That's a great, great message for kids. Um, one of my personal favorites, Lisa Simpson. I know, I know. So Lisa literally on a sort of a side tossed off joke, as you can see there, she created Junior Skeptic Magazine. So Jun I don't know if you know this, Junior Skeptic did not exist until this was sort of a joke. And uh, the folks at Skeptic Magazine said, yeah, let's make a Junior Skeptic addendum in the back of the magazine. So that's thanks to Lisa. Uh, someone once asked me, you know, do you have any tattoos? I said, no. I said, are you going to get a tattoo? I said, no. He said, if you were to get a tattoo, what would you get? And I said, probably Lisa Simpson. Just because she's, you know, she's a musician, she's a scientist. She, ah, it's great. Our next president. Our next president. Very good. Yeah, hopefully. Wouldn't that be something? Lisa Simpson for president. Um, moving on. Going back a little bit in time, we've got the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew. Anybody read these books growing up? It's great stuff, right? Again, sort of selecting clues, finding stuff. It's never ghosts. It's always someone trying to with the secret room, and it's always pirates and whatever the thing is. But it's always there's always some solution. I love this explanation of Nancy Drew compared to uh, Tintin. So uh, she studied psychology in school. She's familiar with power suggestion and association. She's a painter. She speaks French. She runs motorboats. She's a skilled driver, a sure, sh a sure shot, an excellent swimmer, skillful oarsman, expert seamstress, gourmet cook, and a fine bridge player. She played tennis and golf and rode like a cowboy. She danced like Ginger Rogers and could administer first aid like Florence Nightingale. No pressure, ladies. No pressure. <laughs> these books are great, and there's a thousand of them, and they're really, really fun, and they keep repurposing them. And these characters are good, because what do they do? They search for evidence, they find evidence, they teach kids that there's usually a really logical answer. Speaking of which, The Great Brain. This is something I read as a kid that was just really, really fun. Um, it's, uh, again, just a, a, it's a kid just figuring stuff out. And what's neat is they deal with topics like racism, intolerance, uh, the lives of Native Americans on reservations, the second class status of Jews, you know, some heavy stuff for kids' books. But it's dealt with and it's shown how illogical that kind of behavior is. So very influential. Um, we get to Encyclopedia Brown. I know, another one. Just, it's so wonderful, and these books totally hold up. And what's great about Encyclopedia Brown is there's actually a logical fallacy inserted into the story. So that was the first time I had, had heard that term of a logical fallacy being used, that someone made some kind of a, an assumption, and at the end, the final chapter of the book, sorry, the end of the final chapter of the book um, always explains this is the logical fallacy that was made, and this is what was actually going on. Really, really fun. Um, Madeline. Madeline, she's adventurous, she's always getting into trouble, but she's great at solving problems. Uh, another one, Harriet the Spy. Now, Harriet the Spy, if you're unfamiliar, she is an anthropologist. She has her notebook and she just watches, she watches people and their behavior so she can figure out what she needs to figure out. She is, in essence, an anthropologist taking notes. I love, I love that about her and teaching kids the value of observation. Uh, this one was pointed out to me as well. Uh, Princess Simmerine 
from dealing with dragons. I love this description. She runs away from her parents when they try to when she they try to make her marry some dopey prince. She gets a job and moves into a cave with a sassy talking dragon. She refuses to be rescued. She makes friends with a cool witch and ends up saving the day. You know, it's nice. Yeah, these are kids' books. Uh, perhaps the most influential right now in terms of children's books and movies is Hermione Granger. Now, yeah. Hermione, of course, is surrounded by magic, but in, in, in the midst of this ocean of magic and stuff that obviously isn't real, she is still being very critically minded. She's going to the library. She's finding old spells. She's finding old potions. She's finding old histories. She's doing research. She's doing the stuff that, that, that kids can do to imitate her and to solve problems. Yes, you're not going to be solving exactly the same kind of problems that Hermione is trying to solve, but you'll be using the same methods and the same processes. It's really, really cool. There's also the Disney princesses who, it's interesting, they get more and more self-assured and more and more critical and more and more kind of independent as the stories go on. So you have, you have Mulan and uh, Merida from Brave, uh, from Brave Moana, uh, Pocahontas, sort of they get, they get far away from Cinderella and things like that. So these are very influential on, on women. Okay. You've got this idea of authority figures. And again, we're going to kind of mix genres a little bit here. But I sort of wanted to think about authority figures in, in uh, popular culture. And the first group is sort of law related. I mentioned Sherlock Holmes. Now, House is included there as well, um, even though he would pretty much self-identify as a skeptic, as an atheist. And when I first realized that, that House was Holmes, it was like, oh, yeah, right. And he is. He's Sherlock Holmes. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually quite amazing. And there's a thousand parallels between the two. And that was totally done on purpose. Um, I mentioned him previously. But Hawkeye, um, who's, who's not so much a law-related, but just an authority figure. Jay and I have talked about Hawkeye as portrayed by Alan Alda. And just greatly influential. He wouldn't necessarily come straight out and say he's an atheist. Or, or, but you could kind of tell. Uh, and it didn't matter. What was great was he, in essence, is Groucho Marx, but he's Groucho Marx that is an amazing surgeon. And that's the thing. He has a skill set. He has this skill set that is incredibly impressive, which allows him to be Groucho Marx. That was very influential on me. That at the, In the end, when put to the test, Hawkeye could do unbelievable feats uh, in the surgical tent that others necessarily couldn't do. And that's why he got to be the kind of guy who didn't salute because he thought that was silly. He didn't carry a gun because he thought that was silly. He questioned everything. So it's very influential on me. You've got uh, from the Seven Samurai, Kambe, who is the sort of the quiet, again, this is a bit of a trope, sort of this quiet, silent warrior who kind of comes in and fixes problems. And so Chris Adams is the same character from the Magnificent Seven as portrayed by Yul Brenner. Same idea, sort of this quiet, he just fixes things. He fixes stuff. He doesn't believe in any nonsense. He fixes things. We move on to other law characters. There's a bunch. Joe Friday from Dragnet, Perry Mason, Kojak, Columbo, even Richard Kimball from The Fugitive. These are all guys that are sort of sort of self, not necessarily self-identifying, but they are using the process of critical thinking to do their jobs really, really well. Richard Kimball's escaping, <laughs> uh, looking for the one-armed man and, and avoiding being pursued. And he's doing it for, what, four seasons? So he's doing it really, really well. But all these guys, they use that process of critical thinking. Columbo, with his you know, Socratic, Socratic questioning, with oh, just one more question, just one more, uh, just one more thing I don't understand. Explain this to me. Explain this to me. Great. It's a great, great example. And then my favorite, oh, no, sorry. There's, yeah, Josiah Bartlett from the West Wing as well. Uh, also sort of a skeptical, critical thinking guy. He has a great thing about, uh, uh, there's a great clip on YouTube where he questions a woman who won't stand, she doesn't stand up and he walks into the room. And have you ever see that thing? And he talks about, uh, 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 she says that uh, gay marriage shouldn't be allowed because it's because the Bible says so. And he goes on this rant, basically listing all the stuff in the Bible, like, oh, are you wearing mixed fabrics? Well, that shouldn't be allowed. Oh, if I'm going to stone uh, someone that, you know, went to church uh, while she was menstruating, what kind of stone should I use? Because it's a great, great clip. Check that out. Okay, now my favorite, Batman. Now, Batman's great because he's a scientist, he's a crime fighter, he's a psychologist, he's a guy who pushed himself to absolute physical limits using a scientific process. He doesn't have a, an amulet. He doesn't have some secret power. He doesn't have some magic spell. He's not born on Krypton. He is just a guy who has pushed himself using 
scientific methods to be as smart as he possibly can, to be as physically fit as he possibly can, to be as competent as he can. You know, it's a defined scientific process. What's great about Batman is that anyone can be Batman. That's what's so great about this character, I always think, because anyone, we, you, you can't be born on Krypton. You can't be born on Krypton, and yet you could, you could train yourself to eventually become Batman. I had this theory that, uh, that Trump is actually, like, has just pushed the Bruce Wayne being an asshole thing too far. <laughs> That's my theory, that he's actually Batman somewhere, but maybe not, we'll see. Um, <laughs> now we move on to uh, authority figures in the parental column. Atticus Finch. Again, Roof Scout, uh, fighting, fighting racism as best as he can, critically thinking, you know, letting his kids know not to be scared of the dark, doing that kind of stuff that's necessary. Just brilliant portrayal, of course, in the film, but in the book as well. Um, uh, Katie Nolan in A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, is, she's a single mom, uh, sort of doing the best she possibly can. It's a great example of a critically minded, just solves problems. It's a single mom solving problems. Uh, a Wrinkle in Time, again, this is a children's book, but such a great, great, interesting book. And the parents, uh, the, the father is a physicist and the mother is a microbiologist. This is the first time I read the word tesseract in a book. It was just like, what is that? Yeah, so that was very, very exciting. Um, you've got sort of these parental figures from 50s TV, Ma and Pa Engels. I mean, always just calm. Again, they would self-identify as religious, but they are problem solvers, and they're ones that just use rationality, use skepticism, and they just approach problems really smartly. Ben Cartwright on Bonanza. Everyone calm down. We'll fix the problem. I know the Ponderosa's on fire. We'll fix it. It's totally fine. Andy Taylor, same thing. This idea, almost like this extension of this Scapino character, this kind of just really chill, calm guy. He, he may come across as a bumpkin, but he actually knows way more than anyone else in the room. Really, really cool. Mrs. Garrett and Mr. Drummond. Now, Mrs. Garrett, again, like, you watch these shows and you sort of see that she is this calm center amidst this fury of, of crazy teenage-based behavior, and they always turn to Mrs. Garrett, and they say, what are we gonna do? And Mrs. Garrett figures it out. Same thing with Mr. Drummond. You know, Mr. Drummond in integrating his, his house. Uh, it's just, it's, a, it's an interesting father figure, sort of critically thinking, critically minded, and not, not caring what the neighbors think necessarily. Now, this might seem like it's a silly joke, but growing up, there's three episodes of The Brady Bunch that influenced me, and I'm showing my Gen X tendencies, I know, I know, and I apologize for the younger people in the audience, but we used to have this thing called TV, and there's three episodes in particular. There's the one that, that Greg has the UFO in the backyard, which he does with the thing, right? Don't, don't clap, because it's not really worth it, but um, <laughs> proven to be just BS by the, by the dad. Um, there is the one where they have the trial, where the guy that used to play Uncle Fester uh, is uh, uh, claiming that he had whiplash, and Mr. Brady throws the briefcase, and the guy turns his head, and it's just like, that was a great solution. I remember being a kid thinking like, yeah, Mr. Brady's really smart. And what's the third one? And there's a third thing. Uh, Department of Defense? No, what was the third one? Not the Hawaii one. Oh, oh no, the driving competition, yeah, where they have a driving competition to see who the better driver is, and they put the egg on the cone. You know, they have a, a parking cone, and they have to pull up as close as they possibly can, and if you knock the egg off, then they don't get the license, or they don't get the car for the weekend, or whatever it was. It's like a problem solving, a critically minded problem solving to a situation in the family that they didn't have a solution towards. So I always loved Mr. Brady. Um, now, from the regrettable baggage department, um, these two characters, uh, Claire Huxtable has maintained, she's from the Cosby Show, obviously, but she's a lawyer, again, very calm, problem solver. Roseanne also, sort of, uh, sort of along the lines of Andy Taylor, uh, uh, Sheriff Andy Taylor from the Andy Griffith Show, a similar thing, kind of blue collar and yet questioning a lot, uh, trying to solve her life's problems as best as she possibly can. Uh, Probably the biggest father figure, the doctor, yes. The doctor from, from Doctor Who, of course, who is just, that is all he is. He is all about using, using rationality and, and brains and not weapons and hate. And that's pretty much, I mean, if we're gonna have a mantra, that's pretty much where it should be at. Which brings us into our sort of authority figure, science fiction. So the captains, of course. 
which again, these now somewhat start to self-identify as skeptics and scientists, but you understand what I'm getting for. The best all-time skeptical line ever said by any Star Trek captain, excuse me, what does God need with a starship? Right? It's just like, yeah! And that's from Star Trek V, which is not a good one, but it's still got the best skeptical line of all times. Uh, and then sort of in that, in that party with them as well, Spock obviously gets, uh, gets mentioned. And then you've got Princess Leia and Ellen Ripley. Again, problem solvers. Yeah, just hardcore problem solvers. Really cool. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're good. Um, moving over into comedy. Now, this is, again, sort of what we had before, that line straight through from the Italian street theater of the 16th century all the way up to Black Adder. If you're not familiar with Black Adder, it's so fantastic. Black Adder takes place in every season is in a different time period, which is just mixes things up just enough to keep it interesting, going all the way up to World War I. Um, one, of the, one of his nemeses here has this great line, if nothing else works, a total pig-headed unwillingness to look facts in the face will see us through. You know, that's the, that's the person that Blackadder's always up against. So it's kind of, those are his enemies. So these are now, these characters sort of are comedians that portray, portray characters. So you've got Richard Pryor has his mudbone character who's like a wino philosopher. Again, sort of questioning things. The Smother, Smothers Brothers playing a version of themselves on TV, but again, questioning stuff. Had a huge influence on helping to, to, to curb the Viet Vietnamese War. Um, Elaine May and Mike Nichols, very influential, always playing interesting characters that are questioning stuff. Lily Tomlin also. Stan Freeberg, I had to include, I'm a personal, just I, I adore Stan Freeberg. Stan Freeberg was refused to have a, a cigarette company be his radio sponsor in the 50s, which was like a really big deal. He did a great bit about the commercialization of Christmas in the, again, in the 50s, so very, very influential, very big deal. Very religious person, but he would totally identify as a, as a skeptic. And now we sort of cross over into not so much characters, but these comedians, and this is where we get into actual people now who are just sort of skeptical. I mean, obviously, George Carlin, Lenny Bruce, Mort Saul, Alan King, Joan Rivers, Richard Pryor. George Carlin, I mean, if one of the best sort of philosophical arguments is him talking about how he doesn't believe in God, he believes in Joe Pesci. <laughs> I think it's from, a, from, I think it's from You're All Diseased, which I think was, was his third or fourth to last HBO special that he did. Look that up on, on YouTube, just uh, Carlin, God, Pesci. And he says, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't pray to God, I pray to Joe Pesci. He seems like a nice guy. I pray to Joe Pesci, and the weather is going to do what it's going to do. You know, I, it, that's my, my terrible distillation of what, that's, of what that is. So um, we move on to uh, uh, sort of hosts along that same line. So you've got Steve Allen, Dick Cavett. You've got Johnny Carson there with some, I'm not sure who that is with Johnny Carson, but as well as sort of, sort of in that same category, Jamie Heineman and Adam Savage from Mythbusters. And the Mythbusters never wanted to do a skeptical show. That was not their intent. They did not say, let's make a show about skepticism. They, made a show, they wanted to make a show about curiosity, which goes to our previous panel, and it's one of the most successful science shows of all time. Uh, there's a straight through line where you get sort of the SNL influence now, where you again have these news people who sort of are influencing and they're critically minded thinkers. So you go from Al Franken, who is now a senator. He goes literally from playing, he's the only person to portray a senator in an SNL sketch and become a senator in real life, which is really great. <laughs> Tina Fey, Liz Winstead, sort of the creators of The Daily Show, obviously, you know, Samantha B. If you're not watching Samantha B., she is so incredibly funny and smart and good and an absolute critical thinking hero, a skeptical hero. So it's very, very cool. Uh, quickly, we jump ahead and I just, I had to include some, some music examples. Obviously, Frank Zappa, Tom Lair, my favorite band Rush because I have to put them in the middle because there you go. Uh, Weird Al, Pink Floyd, they all have, I know there's tons of examples and I'm leaving tons of people out, but the whole punk movement, this idea, the clash, this idea of questioning things, questioning things, questioning things. You question, why do we do it that way? Why do we do it that way? Why are these things set up the way they are? And they do it musically. Songs like, uh, you know, Free Will by Rush or that whole, whole album about free will in essence. Um, really wonderful stuff. Okay. So... In conclusion, like I said, I, I left a lot of people out, I am sure, and there's tons of examples. Please, uh, please angrily email me, and I will ignore it. But uh, feel free to make yourself feel good. So 
I mentioned that an early influence on me was the professor uh, from Gilligan's Island, who was. He was a great big influence on me. But there was someone before the professor that was a, an even larger influence on me, I think, and I was much younger. And it was the first time that a piece of non-logical thinking was scaring me. It was something that I thought about and, and that frightened me. And this particular TV personality assured me that it was okay and that it wasn't going to be a problem. Like many boys, uh, or children in general, um, I was worried that I would go down the drain when I was a kid. I was worried that I would, I would, I would go down the toilet or that in the shower I would go down the drain. And of course, Mr. Rogers, he assured me, he said, you can, you're much, you can never go down the drain. You're much too big to go down the drain. And you had to think about it logically for a second and say, oh, yeah, okay, okay, I'm, I am. I'm too big to go down the drain. It's not, it's not going to happen. Mr. Rogers has this wonderful thing that he talked about. Well, what do you tell children when they're in the middle of some kind of, when they're observing some kind of horrible disaster, some kind of a horrible thing, whether it's 9-11, whether it's a piece of news, whether it's just even something that's in your, in your town or across the street that's happening. And he says this, always look for the helpers. There's always someone trying to help. And it's a great point because in the worst of times, sort of the best of us can be brought out. And the best of us often is inclusive and critically minded and willing to help. So I ask you, finally, as a final sort of question, who maybe has had more influence across the board and across the world in tackling societal problems and addressing clear, concise, and universal concepts of sharing, thinking clearly the values of ideas and skill? Um, is it a firebrand? shouting about how stupid belief is? Or is it a calm, soft-voiced minister sporting puppets and wearing a cardigan and sneakers? Thank you very much.